de Kisili. And there, you're going to leave this uh, lecture feeling really confused, overwhelmed. <laughs> this is usual. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's new? <laughs> overwhelmed. Uh, Jacob, I'm not even going to let you make it. But instead, we would even be happy. You're not even enrolled. Shut up. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you will leave happy, but happy in that way, like, you just took a massive dose of something fun. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, 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 anyway. Um, but no, 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 no. I think one thing that you will appreciate when you leave this lecture is why our modern understanding of QCD came about 50, 60 years after we understood ENM. When, it might seem a little strange because after all they're both kind of the same sort of theory and I'm hoping to convey that to you today although there's going to be a lot of extra details. But roughly speaking, what we're going to do is we're going to construct QCD today, the theory of the strong nuclear interactions, and we're going to parallel as closely as possible what we did last time talking about electricity and magnetism, okay? So here is a very brief synopsis of where we ended up last time for our description of electricity and magnetism. We eventually found our way to this Lagrangian, uh, where the first two terms we can more compactly write in terms of a covariant derivative, capital D mu, which is defined this way. But one of the features that we notice in constructing this Lagrangian is that we were forced to introduce this term, which is an interaction between the psi field and the A mu field. And then, of course, we can allow psi to have a mass. And then the A mu field was given its own kinetic term to allow it to propagate, but we discovered that for invariance, the mass of the A field had to be zero. And then we defined this kinetic term F mu nu in terms of either the commutator, or we defined it in terms of the commutator of the covariant derivative, and we found that in the, in the case of electricity and magnetism, it simplified to this. And this entire construction was motivated by wanting to make this transformation of psi and corresponding transformation of psi bar uh, a symmetry of the theory. Now, I don't know if we ever actually named it, but let's just go ahead and do it. Gage, would you like to tell us what kind of symmetry this corresponds to? <laughs> right? My symmetry? What'd you say? My symmetry? My symmetry. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, so it's a gauge symmetry. We front loaded that one, obviously. Okay. And this, of course, you might or might not recognize as the gauge symmetry of electromagnetism. Remember, A mu, you can break up into a time-like piece and the three spatial pieces. The time-like piece of A mu is just the scalar potential from electromagnetism, the one that gives you the E field if you take the gradient. And the three spatial components of A mu, A, X, A, Y, A, Z, those are the three components of the magnetic vector potential. And so if you take this expression and you think about it, uh, it just corresponds to those gauge uh, transformations that you've seen in electromagnetism just combined into one single four vector. Um, okay, so are there any questions about any of the bits of this before we get started today? Because we're really going to follow this as closely as possible, so if there's an outstanding confusion, you really need to point it out now. Chances are it will be shared among the class. No? Yeah? Do it, Kowalski. Ask a question. Okay. There are no stupid questions. There's only the ones that Matt asks. <laughs> so. We love you, man. We, we picked a transformation uh, that, we wanted, that we sort of saw was invariant from Lagrangian. Globally invariant. Right. Yeah. But, but like you said, um, I guess what we got out of that is a prediction that there is uh, spin one half massive fields that interact. Spin, with spin one. <coughs> oh, so the spin, the spin one half, half field is the side. That's the thing we started with. But that's the massive field, right? Well, we, it could be massive. We could have made it massless by leaving this term out. That was oh, a freedom. Okay, right, so that's, that's what weirds me out. It's like, if you leave the mass out of that, then aren't we predicting that there are, because you can leave the mass out, it's still a variant, now you're predicting there are massless than one half fermions that interact with electromagnetism. And sure, sure. Can you so, see those? Well, that... so first of all, this doesn't predict anything. Right? Okay. What, we're, what we're formulating are models. Yeah. Where, for example, uh, M, I have to go and measure an experiment. Right. Um, and for that matter, Q, I have to go measure in the experiment. Q is the, basically the electric charge. Okay. Okay. So there's a sense in which 
This expression describes some dynamics, how things propagate, their interactions. And then what we do is we go and we apply this to, for example, uh, electromagnetism with electrons, which have mass, and we would use this, and it would accurately describe that. But then if we had a massless charged particle, right? Okay, which we don't, but if we did, we could describe it with this thing by setting that term to zero. Right, so, so then this is a model that if we find something that applies to the model, we, we can use it, but there, it's not in that sense that it doesn't predict part. Sure, where, where, there's some, where there's some predictivity in this is the idea that the form of this term, which could have been anything, I could have just multiplied the fields together and created any interaction term I wanted, but the specific form of this interaction term is dictated by the symmetry. Right. And it turns out that this agrees with experiment. So there's a sense in which the form of the interactions are following some kind of symmetry principle. And it turns out that that extends to the strong and the weak interactions as well, as well as gravity. Okay, so there's a level where it's sort of predictive. Gotcha. You have a symmetry principle, you gauge it, you see an interaction. Most of the and time you see that in nature. Yeah, yeah. Unless it's a massless for you know, a massless charge. Well, we like, to, we like to keep things as general as possible. And uh, you know, the, the important thing to point out is that this mass can be non-zero and it can be gauge invariant. However, the mass for A has to be zero sure. for gauge invariance. Other questions? Okay. Here we go. If you have ever been curious about the other fundamental forces of nature, about which you've probably learned this much in your physics education so far, you are about to learn all about them, starting with quantum chromodynamics. So uh, to get started, we need a Lagrangian with some global symmetry. And um, one of the things that I've already alluded to uh, by the way, if I were going to give this thing a name, uh, the symmetry transformations, these e to the iq's, are local u1 transformations. That is, they are one by one complex matrices, which means they're complex numbers, and they satisfy that u dagger u equals the identity, which you can trivially see. If you dagger it, won't clap by itself. The exponentials cancel and you get the identity. Okay? Local, because the, para the parameter by which I'm transforming is allowed to vary from point to point. Okay? Now, um, I'm going to not try and tease out quantum chromodynamics from sort of observation or first principles, but I'm just going to suggest asymmetry, and then we'll build a Lagrangian and then a, a local theory based on it. Um, and so the local symmetry that we're going to use for quantum chromodynamics, if I can just interrupt this, is going to be a symmetry based on SU3. Okay, now I can immediately predict a few things that are going to make this case more complicated. So, uh, for example, and let's just pick Joe, because he's sitting in front of the room and happens to be the next card. Let's go over a couple of features of U1 in particular that we uh, that, that makes this story a little easy. How many generators does U1 have? One. One. Uh, what is the dimensionality of a U1 transformation? Also one. One. Good. So you have one generator, and the sort of dimension of the space in question is one-dimensional. Okay. Now let's pick on somebody else. Daniel, are you here? Daniel. There you go. Daniel. How many generators does this have? Uh, three. <laughs> well, actually, okay. So, how many how many dimensions of a, of a transformation space do you expect this to live in? Three. Three. Good. Uh, Jacob. Uh, six. How many generators does this have? I think six. Is it not? Eight. It's eight. What's the formula? <laughs> it's n squared minus one. Okay, it's okay if you don't remember, okay? So this had one generator, and it's sort of a 1D space that it acts in, 
This is going to have eight generators, and it's going to act in a 3D space. So we can already see something weird compared to electromagnetism is going to crop up, and it's going to be, it's, this is going to be the source of a lot of the headaches associated with quantum chromodynamics. Okay. All right, so uh, let's first of all get this 3D space that these transformations are going to act on notated. Yes, thing. I was just wondering, so did you, did you ever do anything with like a sort of, I guess it'd be like a semi-local type uh, interference, where it's like you make it so that in a certain energy landscape it, it looks local, but then it predicts something like elsewhere, so you can make it match to experiment, but then predict something in a different regime? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we should talk about that after class. <laughs> I'd have to think about that. Uh, there's actually some really interesting, uh, there's a result from string theory actually that there are no global symmetries. Everything is actually a gauge symmetry. And it's kind of the nature of way, the way symmetries arise in string theory. But um, in the normal field theory context, I'd have to think about that. Um, there are actually, there's, there's quite a bit of, well, actually, there's sort of a difference in what we mean by gauge symmetry and what we mean by global symmetry in a more meta level. And this is still a question that's sort of up for debate, and I might touch on that later on in the semester. But for now, let me just dig into sort of more the, the canonical information about QCD. And by the way, QCD is relatively young. It was really put on a good footing about 1973. So it's approximately one year older than somebody. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, well, somebody was born in 1974. <laughs> is that not? Is that? Yeah. Okay. So we need we need something that lives in a three-dimensional vector space, and I'm just going to say, first of all, it's going to be a Dirac spinner, because all of the matter that we know of in the universe is uh, spin a half particles, okay, that we've observed. And so we know it's going to, at least in part, be described by a Dirac equation with Dirac spinners. So I'm going to use the same symbol, psi, except, and remember, this is a four-component spinner. So at the end of the day, there's a four-element thing in spin space, but now I'm going to make it not only four-component in spin space, but I'm going to give it three components in color space. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, that's awesome. And these are, these are going to be, oh, that is such weak sauce. The one time I need a red marker. <laughs> Son of a bitch. All right, well, well it's just going to be all black today. We're doing this on our time. You throw a red marker in the back of my head, I'm going to turn around and teach to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it doesn't matter, I've already done it in black. Once you've got black, <laughs> you can't go back to that blue and green. So, let's be, let's be efficient here. Okay, so we are going to uh, give this thing psi three components in what we call a color space. Okay, so red, blue, and green, uh, you can think of them as uh, a basis in color space. Again, color space has nothing to do with spin space. Spin space is a four component space and one way to keep them separate is if you do a Lorentz transformation, if you do a rotation or a boost, that affects the four components of the spinner but doesn't touch the red, blue, and green labels. If I do an SU3 transformation, that's going to affect the red, blue, and green labels, and it's not going to touch what's happening in space-time. So these are really two different vector spaces. We often call the vector spaces like this isospaces or internal vector spaces, just to make sure you're not confused between those vector spaces and the vector spaces that are more akin to space-time. And remember, in space-time, we have also two kinds of vector spaces because we have the vector space associated with <coughs> vector type indices but then we also have the spin vector spaces and those spin and space-time vector, in, in, uh, vector indices those both transform under space-time transformation but this kind of space is not going to be touched it's a completely different animal okay so we have this three component thing and that's a natural 
object for three by three complex matrices to add on. Yes. Um, are each of the size a base in color, the bases in color space, or is it like the? I'm confused. Is it the three component vectors? Yeah. So you can kind of think of them like this. Those are your three basis vectors. <laughs> so psi red alone would be this, psi blue alone would be this, and psi green alone would be that. It's just we're not going to call the axes in the, ve in the vector space x, y, and z because x, y, and z is what we use for space time. So what we're going to do is we're going to call them red, blue, and green <laughs> because that's the obvious choice. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, a couple of things to, to keep in mind. Um, each of these sides is a four component spinner. Okay? So you can think of this as a three component vector of spinners. Or just think of it as a, as a spinner in spin space and a vector in color space. That's probably the simplest way to do it. Okay, don't try and, and concatenate these things. Now, um, here's a very important, and, and I'm not going to get into what we call flavor today. That will come in the next topic. But uh, flavor is just a really fancy word because they were obviously smoking something when they were doing this <laughs> physics. Uh, but flavor is really a code word for... Uh, particle type. So what I mean by that is when I say electron, I mean it's a, the flavor is electron. If I say it's a neutrino, an electron neutrino, the flavor is electron neutrino. Okay. A spicy neutrino? A spicy neutrino? No, but we have a, a, a muonic neutrino, oh, okay. which is the next the best thing. thing. <laughs> now, 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 an important thing is that everything that I'm going to talk about today only acts on, uh, what type of particles do you think it only acts on, Will? The color spinners? No, of the, of the kinds of particles you've heard of in the standard model, which ones do you think the strong interactions are going to oh, act like? Nucleons. And what are nucleons in the standard model? What are they made of? Uh, collections of quarks. Quarks, exactly. So it only acts on quarks. And we haven't really gone into a notation of all the different matter content of the standard model, and we'll do that in time. For today, um, I'm going to largely talk about quarks because it's the only kind of particle that really matters for the strong interactions. We'll talk about the other kinds of particles when we talk about the weak interactions. So, so what the, re the, thing I, the reason I, I bring this up at this point is there are um, six types of quarks. There's up quarks, down quarks, uh, strange quarks quarks, charmed quarks, bottom quarks, and top quarks. And each of these quarks can come in red, blue, or green. Okay? So if you think about it, there's really this huge multiplicity of types of quarks. The important distinction, though, is that these are different flavors of quarks, and they have different properties. So an up quark has a different mass than a down quark. Okay, and different electric charge, it turns out. Okay, but if I take a red up quark and a blue up quark, they're actually identical, except one is red and one's blue. Okay, so that's why we don't call a red, blue, a red quark and a blue quark different quarks, because they share all the same properties, so they're really just two different color states of the same quark. That's going to be very different when we do the weak interactions, all right? So everything that I'm about to talk about, we could really just be applying to a single flavor of quark. We might just be talking about an up quark. And then we're talking about red, blue, and green versions. And by the way, there's antiparticles for all of these. So there's up bar, S bar, B bar, B bar, C bar, T bar. And each of those carries an anti-color. So that's red, anti-red, anti-blue, anti-green. OK? Yes. If like an up red and an up blue are identical, how do you actually tell them apart? No, no, no. They're not identical. They have different color, but all of their other properties are the same. They have the same mass. They have the same electric charge. They actually have the same weak isocharge. How do you measure color? Like how do you tell? Well, then, then you're getting into experiments, and we're going to have to wait till we do calculations to compare to experiments. So that's far down the road. Okay. So color is just a state of the quark. 
so it can color. Well, I mean, I mean, actually, so let me let me actually say this. So another way to think about it is that color is a type of charge. Because it's going to turn out that the interaction, the QCD interaction, is going to be an interaction that's based on whether something has color or not. So one way to think about why the strong force only acts on quarks is because they're the only things that have color. In the same way that electromagnetism only cares about things that carry charge. Do they have to have color? The quarks do. Okay, so they can't be colorless. Well, you can create combinations of them that are colorless in the same way that you can create a combination of things that have no net charge. And in fact, and we'll talk about this when we get to calculations, in nature, we never find single quarks. We always find bound states of quarks. And in fact, we only find bound states of quarks that are colorless. But you can't take a single quark and make it colorless. That wouldn't, that wouldn't work. Okay, but that's a detail we're going to talk about later on down the road. Okay? So one way to think about color is that it's like giving the quark three different kinds of charge. Now I want to be really careful because you guys are very comfortable with the notion of charge from electromagnetism and this is very different. In electromagnetism there's one type of charge. It's the electric charge Q and it can have different values. Okay, so we know that in, in nature we tend to run into minus E and plus E as sort of the fundamental quantized values of electric charge. These are not two different charges, they're two different values of electric charge. Okay? Red, blue, and green are three different kinds of charges. Each of them can take on a plus or a minus form in the sense of red and anti-red, or blue and anti-blue, or green and anti-green, okay? But you, for example, could never take a red and an anti-blue and add them together and get colorless, because they're different kinds of charges. They don't cancel each other. Anti-blue is a negative value? You can think of it as negative. Okay. Um, can a quark have multiple colors if it's in color space, if it's a vector in color space? Sure, yeah, 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 yeah. This is just a basis. I mean, a general quark state is going to be some vector in this three-dimensional space sharing red, blue, and green. So even though you say we can, it kind of seems weird to be able to say that anti-blue is negative blue because... <laughs> well, it's negative in the sense that if I take an, an anti-blue quark and a blue quark and I put them together, the total color charge is zero. Okay. All right. Here we go. I take a deep breath and just hold on. So here is our starting Lagrangian. And again, I'm going to stick as closely as humanly possible to the development we did for electromagnetism. So to that end, my starting Lagrangian is just going to be the free Dirac Lagrangian. Okay? Where psi bar is I psi dagger gamma zero. Okay? But, as we might expect, now that the size in here are secretly three component vectors in color space, we might anticipate that part of the definition of psi bar is to include transposition in color space. We already include transposition in the spin space. So if we write psi as a spinner this way, we write psi bar as a row spinner. The same thing with color space. And that's just so that we can use matrix multiplication to manipulate things. <coughs> so this, this operation here is transposing both in spin space and in color space. <coughs> Okay, 
Okay, this is the exact same Lagrangian we started with for electri electricity and magnetism. The only thing we've changed is we've made this psi a three component object. Okay? All right, so uh, step one of our process is to identify a Maddie, to identify a of the Lagrangian. I don't really know what Jacob and Joe were trying to tell you, but yeah, circular jazz hand. <laughs> yeah, it's, I noticed the jazz hand, but I like it. Yeah, turned that into physics. You got Rochelle doing. Oh, guys, don't, everybody quit doing jazz hands. What you saying? <laughs> yeah, a global symmetry. Okay, so um, so a global symmetry. Remember, the global symmetry it already has, and then the work is going to be making it local. So this is invariant under the following transformation. I take psi and I create psi prime, which is given by e to the minus i q over h bar c lambda dot phi times psi. Okay? So that's obviously a symmetry of this uh, action. Are there any questions? Was what? It <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. No, there's no way I would write that down and expect that to make sense. Okay, so this is quite a bit more complicated than what we wrote down in this case. Here we used an exponential, we used the i. This q was electric charge and phi was just the amount by which we were transforming. We see certain aspects here. We see a Q, we see an I, there's clearly an exponential. Uh, the factor of H bar C is just coming in by convention. You could go to natural units and set it to one if you like. Uh, but this piece is the one that's really new and interesting, lambda dot phi, okay? So let's actually talk a little bit about what that could be. So recall um, for a Lee group, um, we use the exponential map to create finite transformations from generators. Okay? So what we have here is a vector of generators, and then this is a vector of parameters. If it makes you more comfortable, you could call this a dual vector of generators, although we don't distinguish between dual vectors and vectors in this particular case. So you can just lower the index and raise it so you can just identify the summation convention, but it really doesn't matter upper and lower here. Okay, so, so these, when we talked about rotations as an example, the G's were in three spatial dimensions, the Pauli matrices or those three by three matrices with like 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. So the G's were a bunch of matrices, and these are just numbers. So each matrix gets a number. <clears throat> this number is telling you how much you're transforming for that particular generator transformation. Yeah. Okay, so, so there's a generator for a rotation in the XY plane, and then the parameter would be the angle you're rotating in the XY plane. Then there's a generator for rotation in the YZ plane, and it has an angle, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So if we compare this general expression to what we have up here, we can think of the lambda as a vector of generators and the phi as a vector of parameters. Okay. Now, um, going back to the case of electromagnetism for comparison, phi is the thing that we will eventually give space-time dependence. Not the generators, it's the parameters. We allow a different amount for different positions. So later we expect to take the phi part of this story and let it depend on position. But the lambdas are always just going to be a set, a fixed set of constant generators. Okay? Now, uh, as a set of generators, lambda is a funny thing. If I actually wanted to give it indices, um, I could say that lambda has an index A and then two indices I and J. 
where the A is an index in the generator space and the IJ are in the color space. So what do I mean by that? The, the generators always have the matrix form of the type of transformation you're going to do. So we're going to do SU3 transformations. So the lambdas themselves have to be 3x3 three three complex matrices. So that's what the I and J would tell you. But there are eight of them. And that's what the A is labeling. OK? Now, we're never going to write these indices explicitly. We're going to leave off the A and the IJ. OK? But in particular, when I write lambda dot phi, what I have in mind is really that there's a set of the lambdas and a set of parameters and I just match up the parameter with the corresponding generator. So that's what lambda dot phi means. Yes, Spencer. Is this, is this an abstractification of the U1 case? Like this is a generalization of the U1 case to a non-abelian group with multi, multiple generators. I mean, it has to have multiple generators to be non-abelian. So a lot of this story could be easier if you had a, a group with multiple generators but was abelian. It would be a little more complicated, but it won't be as complicated as QCD's. QCD is going to be really complicated because it's a multi-generator group and it's not abelian. We haven't even gotten to the complication from not abelian yet. This is just what you have to do if you have multiple generators. Um, okay, so uh, last but not least, uh, this lets us sort of identify uh, this quantity my, uh, Q over H bar C as what we're going to call uh, uh, G, which is the coupling. Okay, so we're going to give it a generic name of the coupling uh, of the uh, strong force. And um, what's important about it is that you might think that there could be three couplings in QCD, one for the red charge, one for the blue charge, one for the green charge, okay? But the problem, with if, or the problem with assigning three different couplings, and, and a coupling is essentially how strong the force is. Okay, if, if, if a force has a very large coupling, then that means the matter it's, it's interacting with is it's going to very strongly interact. If it's got a very weak coupling, then it's going to be a very weak, relatively weak force. And we'll talk about the strength of forces in due time. However, if I tried to assign a red coupling, a blue coupling, and a green coupling, if I do an SU3 transformation, it's just going to mix them up. And that's not going to be symmetric. So in order for it to be symmetric, um, to have any hope of being symmetric, we have to have just a single QCD coupling that we're going to call G. So there's only one QCD coupling, even though there's three flavors, even though there's eight generators. Okay. Likewise, there was only one coupling for electricity and magnetism. And there will only be one coupling for the weak interactions. And there's only one coupling for gravity. So each force gets one coupling, even though you can have multiple things of other stuff. Okay. So here we go. Step two is that I would like to make this thing invariant under a local form of this transformation. Insist on invariance under, and now I literally just write down the local form of this. And as I mentioned earlier, the only thing that that's going to change is that phi is now going to become a function of position. Okay. Now, just what, just like with electromagnetism, um, if all I do is do this transformation, I don't have invariance. It's, it, everything gets screwed up. And it gets screwed up for the same reason that we had a problem in electromagnetism. Okay? Where in the case of electromagnetism, RL, what was it about the local transformation that gave us a problem when we were doing the electromagnetism example? 
Yeah, so the problem was that the transformation itself could not move past the derivative because it depends on position. So in, in principle, you have to take the derivative of it. Okay, if this was a global transformation that's like this, you could take this entire prefactor and move it past the derivative. And then in the Lagrangian, the transformation of psi would just come all the way over and cancel with the one for psi bar. But that's not going to happen for a local transformation and we have to fix it. Okay? But the good news is, is that we can fix it in a very similar way that we fixed it in electromagnetism. So uh, if we take the ordinary derivative and replace it by a covariant derivative, then we might hope that if we define things correctly, we can get invariance. But there's going to be a slight difference as compared to electromagnetism. Our new derivative, <coughs> oh great, now I've got to go to blue. And then I'm going to be writing like red on the board for red cork, and I'm going to be writing it in blue, and everybody's going to be confused except for the colorblind people. All right. <laughs> What's that being mean? This honest. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Here we go. So my new covariant derivative, and by the way, this is being replaced by this. It's not that I'm transforming into this. My new covariant derivative is going to be d mu uh, plus i g lambda dot a mu. Okay, so what, what, if we compare to electromagnetism, it's very similar, d mu plus i q a mu. Okay, I've got my i, I've got my coupling, but here I just had a mu, here I have lambda dot a mu. Okay, so what's happening here is that since I have eight generators labeled by a, it turns out I'm going to have to introduce eight gauge fields one for each generator. Okay, so this is really just code for i g lambda 1 a 1 mu plus i g lambda 2 a 2 mu plus dot 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 dot. You just sum over them. So our new derivative is actually going to have nine total terms. The derivative plus eight terms with the eight gauge fields. Of course compactly we'll just call that lambda dot a. Okay. Now remember, the lambdas are three by three matrices in color space, but there's eight of them. There are eight gauge fields, but these are not, these are, these are trivial in color space. Okay. These are just going to be a way of encoding what's happening in space time. The A carries a space time index, which you know something over here has to carry a space time index, because I, I couldn't add something to D mu if it didn't have a lower mu somewhere. Yes, Rochelle. Did you say that the size of the 3x3 in color space? I said that the lambdas are 3x3 three three in color space. Oh, okay. Because the lambdas are basically going to give me the form of the SU3 <coughs> transformation eventually. Okay? All right. Now, one way that you could one way that you could come to this conclusion is you could literally start with a single generator, a single type of SU3 transformation, and then write write down a Lagrangian which is invariant under a local version of that, and then you could go to the next type of SU3 transformation and do a local and and if you just went through the list of all eight different types of transformations, you would eventually accrue a set of eight terms here. So we're just going to do it all at once. Um, yes. Okay, so uh, what we want... Now remember from the electromagnetism story, we started out by saying this is how psi and psi bar transform and then we introduced this new derivative and then based on insisting on the invariance we deduced how this transformed. 
So this we didn't start with. We had to discover this is what we needed in order to have invariance under the local U1. So similarly, introducing this doesn't make it invariant. I've got to go and figure out how this transforms so that it's invariant. Okay? Now, from your homework, you might hopefully have remembered this very important observation. When we introduce a covariant derivative, the point of the covariant derivative is that when I do a transformation, the derivative transforms because it contains this thing and this is going to transform, and of course psi transforms. But the whole point of what you're aiming at with the covariant derivative is that you want this transformation to have an overall factor of the original form of the transformation that you started with. Because what you're essentially doing in this case is you're creating a covariant derivative so that the transformation of d nu psi legitimately acts like you just bring the exponential out of the derivative. Because then this factor will cancel with what you have from the psi bar and you're guaranteed invariance. The reason I say that was in, hopefully brought out in your homework is in your homework you did this uh, a scalar field Lagrangian where you had d mu phi d mu phi and you were trying to make that gauge invariant and if you thought about it really if you could just get one of these to work out so that this transformation ended up being d mu prime phi prime equals e to the I don't know what the particular factors were in your case something like this maybe if you could get one of these derivatives to work out, then you could show that the other derivative would naturally work out as well. This was vice versa, sorry. Okay? Or you could have just multiplied these two terms out and then you got like four terms and you had to do a lot of massaging. But does everyone appreciate how work, thinking about it this way is a more concise way to see that it will eventually be invariant? Because after the transformation, I literally just get this factor out front, which I can use to cancel with a factor coming from this, or a factor coming from that. Okay. So this is what we would like to have happen. And um, let's see what it takes to get that to happen. Okay. So if I take d mu psi, All right, and then I just, like I did in electromagnetism, I transform everything in sight. So my d mu psi prime, psi is gonna transform, a is gonna transform, psi is gonna transform. Okay, I know how psi transforms, that's my starting point. Okay. And when I write this, I'm, phi is going to have position dependence. I'm not going to keep writing it. But this is the transformation I'm writing. And I'm just putting g instead of q over h bar c everywhere. It's just a little easier to write. Okay. So all I've done is I've put in the transformation of psi. That's my starting point. And now I can take this thing and break it up a bit because we know that this is the problem piece because the derivative is going to act on both of these. So we're going to have d mu e to the minus i g lambda dot phi times psi plus e to the minus i g lambda dot phi d mu psi plus this guy. And what I want 
What I want is for this thing to be e to the minus ig lambda dot phi times d mu uh, plus ig lambda dot a mu psi. No, sorry, psi, psi. Okay. That's what I want because this was just the original d mu psi. And what I want is for the, the, new, the new version of that to be just this transformation times what I started with. Okay? So I want this line to be the same as this line. And that's how I pick out how <coughs> a mu prime needs to look. This is exactly what we did in electromagnetism. And in electromagnetism, that's where we then said this. I wish I could say something that easy in this case, but I can't. This is what we need. And it, it literally, just, just stare at it, and you'll see. We need lambda dot a mu prime. So let's go up here and write it, because it's going to be an important part of the story. So we need lambda dot a mu prime to be equal to e to the minus ig lambda dot phi, lambda dot a mu, e to the ig lambda dot phi, plus i over g d mu e to the minus i g lambda dot phi e to the i g lambda dot phi. Okay? This looks really weird, but bear with me. If we take the first term and we plug it in here, this e to the i g lambda dot phi is going to cancel with that e to the minus i lambda i g lambda dot phi. And so this term going in here is just going to give me this times lambda dot a times psi, which is what I want, this times lambda dot a times psi. If I plug this term in, because it's part of this, then again, this e to the i g lambda dot phi is going to cancel with this e to the minus. I'm going to be left with this derivative piece, but that's going to cancel off this offensive term. Okay? And I might, I might need a minus. No, 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 I won't need a minus sign. Okay, so, so you might be looking at this saying, Flournoy, why in the F did you write that? I mean, why, why don't you just move this over here and cancel those and then take that derivative? You know, you'll get a derivative of this, and then you can just let the exponent cancel with that. Why don't we just do that? Well, why can't we do that? Well, can we do that? Why is this so much uglier than that? You can't move the exponentials past the... Why not? The exponentials don't commute with the lambda. Exactly, because this is a non-abelian group. This is a matrix in color space. This is a matrix in color space. This is a matrix in color space. These matrices don't commute with each other. Okay, same here. So this is actually the best we can do. If you had one generator and everything was a one by one matrix, so it commuted, you could just cancel all of these exponentials and you would reduce to exactly this. But unfortunately, for a non-abelian group, we're stuck with this as our transformation rule. It doesn't get any simpler. Okay? Okay, so uh, what, what, uh, what, uh, what, do I, what do I have? What do I have? I got good stuff. Yes. Okay, so, so all of this work was essentially to get at how I need a mu to transform. So now that I have my transformation rule for a mu, I know that my theory is going to be invariant. Okay. But we should look for an interaction, right? Because in QED, or sorry, in electromagnetism, the d mu created this term, and that's where we saw the interaction of the photon or the, the gauge field with the original fermion matter. Okay. 
So here, d mu, capital D mu is going to have these two terms. And when I take d mu psi, I'm going to pick up this times psi. And of course, I'm going to have psi bar gamma mu on this. So this is going to include, among other terms, h bar c, psi bar, gamma mu, i, g, lambda dot, a mu, psi. That's going to be one of them. The other one is just what the derivative gives you. But this is an interaction. Okay? It's an interaction between the psi fields, the gauge fields, and the psi bars. My psi and psi bar are the same field, just the conjugate, conjugates of each other. Okay. So this is the strong interaction. Again, interaction terms in Lagrangians or show, show up as products of dissimilar fields. So what I have done is completed step two. We all want to get to step four, and we're probably going to need it after this. So before we get to step four, what do we need to do? Step three. Okay. So, so, uh, so I'm only going to keep what we need. We have our new derivative. And we know how this transforms. And with this derivative and this transformation, we have an invariant Lagrangian. OK? I just take this and I say, oh, I'm going to make that capital D. Right, now what's the third step? Kinetic. Yeah, we want to let the gauge field propagate. So we need to add in a kinetic term for the gauge field. OK? And we're going to get something surprising and new when we do this. Ashley, you're on deck. <laughs> So what we would like to do is introduce a term that looks something like this. After all, A is a gauge, is a vector gauge field. <coughs> and we've already talked about what the free Lagrangian of a vector field should look like. It should look like the Proca Lagrangian, which takes this form. We could put in a mass term. But we know that if, it, if this was not gauge invariant in the electromagnetism case, there is no way in hell it's going to be gauge invariant for the more complicated case, so we're just not even going to bother. So this is the Proca Lagrangian with the zero mass uh, gauge field. And then um, the question is, so this is my uh, gauge kinetic term. So the question is, uh, what is F mu nu? And again, if we try to steal the definition from electromagnetism, unfortunately, this is too simple. We've got to go back to this more powerful expression. And we'll discover that it does, in fact, give us some differences between this and the electromagnetism case. Go ahead, Rochelle. Sorry, say it again? Oh, I'm missing a pie here. Thank you. By the way, there was a. a there was a typo, on the, or there was an error on the quiz, but it, it didn't impact you. But I wrote p mu p mu is minus e squared over c squared minus p squared. That should have been a plus, but you didn't use that in your quiz. You actually used what this was equal to. So while we're correcting my mistakes. <laughs> anyway, OK, so here we go. The good news is, is this is just cranking it out, because we've already got the covariant derivative. And according to this rule, all we have to do is take minus i over q times the commutator of the covariant derivative with itself. OK? And in this case, I should really be thinking in terms of the coupling g. But you're all aware of this. This is a derivative. You want to evaluate the commutator of a derivative. That is only going to mean anything if you act on something with it. Okay, so to evaluate this, we're going to let it act on a three component spinner psi, and then use this definition, cram it in here, and see what we get. Okay, and um, here we go. So minus i over g d mu plus i g lambda dot a mu d new, and I'm going to skip a big step, but it's written up in the notes. Oh, 
I will write out this step, point something out. Okay, so in the first term, I've done it in the order d mu d nu. So you'll notice the d nu, I've, I've already acted on psi with it, because this is in the first term, this is directly acting on psi. And then all of this, I would then act on with this. And of course this gets complicated because this is gonna be a partial of this, a partial of this, but these depend on space, these depend on space. So there's gonna be a lot of terms that get generated from product rules. And then this is doing it in the opposite order. So of course you could just write down this term and then write it down again with the mu and the new switched everywhere to get both the terms, okay? Uh, and the commutator's minus, but it's led with a negative, so I have a relative sign difference there. But at any rate, uh, if you just expand this out, again, bear in mind, the, the position dependence is here. A nu is a function of where you are, and psi is a function of where you are. Everything else are constants. And even though there's weird, you know, matrix multiplication, this and that and the other, this is just a really simple derivative in space-time. It's not got any weird structure in spin space or color space, so it can just get shoved <coughs> onto anything you need to take the derivative of. Okay? So if you blow this up, you see a whole bunch of terms cancel, and you end up with this. So you end up with d mu lambda dot a nu psi minus d mu lambda dot a mu psi plus i g lambda dot a mu lambda dot a nu psi minus i g lambda dot a nu lambda dot a mu psi. Okay, and you can see where these terms are coming from, that product and that product, and then a lot of the other stuff is canceling. And then this we can concisely write as follows. So f mu nu, which is just minus i over g times the commutator of the derivative, so I'm gonna leave out the size now. I'm gonna take the size away, because I just want the commutator itself. This is going to be d mu lambda dot a nu minus d nu lambda dot a mu uh, plus ig times the commutator of lambda dot a mu lambda dot a nu. Okay. Comparing to electromagnetism, we have a different result, but we can at least see why. The difference in the result is that in this case, this term doesn't vanish. It's a commutator, but this is a non-abelian group, so the commutator is not zero. Whereas in electromagnetism for U1, that commutator would trivially be zero, also because it's got one generator. <laughs> um, but, but if you just ignored this term, this looks pretty much like what we had for electromagnetism. Okay? And to put this in its final form, we can make the following observation. For SU3, the Lie algebra of SU3, which is something you actually saw in your third homework set, is given by the following expression. GI, GJ is I, F, I, J, K, G, K where the f, i, j, k's are the structure constants of SU3. Okay, so you actually worked with this Lie algebra in a homework example very early on. Yeah. And I gave you what these f, i, j, k's are. They're just a bunch of constants, like one over root eight and two fifths and all this kind of crap, okay? But the lambdas are the generators. So we can really just write lambda A, lambda B is I, F, A, B, C, lambda C. Where F, A, B, C are the same structure constants of SU3. The fact that this commutator doesn't vanish has nothing to do with the A's, it's got to do with the lambdas. The lambdas are the matrices. 
The A's are just like numbers in color space. They can, you can do anything you want. So what we can do is, with this is we can say, okay, I'm gonna take a lambda out front of everything. So I'll have a lambda dot. And then if I use the, so if I, if I pull out the two factors of A, this is just a commutator of the lambdas. So I can replace the commutator of the lambdas with that expression from the Lie algebra. And this is going to end up giving me minus G, F, A, B, C, lambda, C, A, mu, A, mu, where if I were going to give these labels, I would write something like that. And if I wanted to give these labels, I could do something like that. And you'll notice there's an overall lambda C that you can pull out of this. So I'm left with sort of this final form of the gauge kinetic term. And one way that you can kind of organize this is you could say that this is just an F mu nu for C. And so I'm doing lambda C, F mu nu for C, where I sum over this C index, and there's eight of them. Okay. Now, I wish that were the end of the story, but it's not F mu nu I need, it's F mu nu, F mu nu. Or it's something that's quadratic, but gauge invariant. And my last point will be what that quadratic gauge invariant <coughs> quantity is. And this is where we'll see one of the more important things that come about from having a non-abelian group. So it turns out that if I want a quadratic term in F mu nu that is gauge invariant, what I should really think about is F mu nu C, F mu nu C. So that is, I contract the mu nu indices like I'm used to, but I sum over the index C. So I can just come into this expression, ignore lambda, grab everything that's left, and basically square it. <coughs> Where in one version I keep the mu and nu down, and in the second version I put the mu and nu up. Okay? And now, if you want to collect your stuff, go ahead. But I'm going to write what this is, and we'll make a very important observation. So here's what this ends up looking like. You guys are awesome. I totally thought everybody would start packing up. You're my heroes. Right now, so <laughs> oh shit. Okay, never mind. I gotta be able to copy what I've got on my paper, so I'm gonna make that an A. It's just a substitution. But there's no way I could get this. You'll see why in a second. Here we go. Alright, A oh my god. Uh, a D E A D mu A E mu D mu A mu A minus D mu a mu a hold on we're almost there we're minus <laughs> over 16 pi f a b c a mu b a mu c d mu a mu a minus d mu a hey it's okay this we're almost the there everybody place. have faith have faith have faith this is not how i learned the alphabet so it's in the alphabet there, see? It wasn't that bad. <laughs> That's awful. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fucking awful. That's pretty awful. Okay, very important observation, and, and this is going to be the end of it. Let's look at this for just a moment. The first term up here should look familiar, right? 
Yeah. If you squint your eyes, that's exactly what we would have written for electromagnetism. Yeah. In particular, notice that these are all A's, which means I would write this down with A equals 1, and then I would write it down with A equals 2, A equals 3, all the way up to 8, and I would add them together. So I'm only going to have A1 times A1, A1 times A1. But look at these. These are multiplying A with one index times A with a different index, A with a different index. And that's rampant throughout here. So these are actually terms multiplying different A's, different gauge fields. What do we call a term that multiplies dissimilar things? It's an interaction. So what these terms are actually representing is the fact that the gauge fields of quantum chromodynamics interact with each other. In electromagnetism, the photon does not interact with other photons, at least at leading order. We'll understand what that means later. But in QCD, the gluons, which are what we call the gauge fields of QCD, the gluons interact with each other. In fact, we can have an interaction with three gluons, one, two, three, or we can have an interaction with four gluons. <coughs> and this gluon-gluon interaction is directly tied to the fact that it's non-abelian. And you can see that because the Fs are a reflection of the fact that it's non-abelian. If it was an abelian group, the Fs would be zero, and all these terms would disappear. So this incredibly rich behavior of QCD that the gauge fields by themselves, like you could literally take all of the matter in the universe away, get rid of all the shit that we're made of, and just let there be QCD gauge fields, they will have a hell of a time playing with each other. <laughs> if you tried that with photons, it would be the most boring exercise in the world because the, the photons would just be like, whoo, I just went through you, I couldn't see you, it's all boring. So when people talk about, for example, what does the QCD vacuum look like? What does it look like when you have nothing but gauge fields? The truth is, is it's a very interesting dynamic thing because the gauge fields can interact with each other, all right? And these are going to have to be included when we start talking about calculations to describe what we see in accelerator experiments. And by the way, these self-interactions are what are responsible, for example, for the prediction of bound states of gluons, these things called glue balls. You can never have a bound state of photons because they don't interact with each other. But if gluons interact with each other, they could form bound states. And these are hypothesized things called glue balls. It's also going to be responsible for what's called uh, confinement in QCD, the idea that you can't see free quarks, and we'll talk about that in detail when we do calculations. Now, to just end this all, next time we're going to talk about the weak interactions based on SU2. Do you think it's going to be this difficult? A little less. A little less? Actually, way more. It's going to have all of these complications and more. Okay, so we'll jump off that bridge when we come to I hope at least, though, that as I promised at the beginning, you have some idea of why it might have taken an extra 50 or 60 years to get this sorted out after they figured out electric <laughs> Yeah, but I gotta hit the lab first, so I'm gonna be like 20 minutes late. Right.